Hi, everybody, and welcome to another installment of Milpa, the Millennial Producers Academy. We are real excited today to have a producer uh, give a presentation. He's a friend of mine. I've known him for so since the 90s uh, doing work. When I was an uh, associate producer of the Mexican-American War for PBS, he was associate producer for the uh, Chicano series, which came out, which was really um, a groundbreaking film and covered a lot of footage that um, they actually had to compile the archive of stills and footage, uh, which had never been assembled in one place for Colorado, New Mexico, California, Texas, etc. Uh, so a really important film. It's on Canopy, which we're promoting because uh, you can get it free through your library with a library card. And um, so it, Ray's been doing really great work. He's been working with national organizations and the film he'll be talking about today, as well as with you know, his career, uh, how he became a producer is called the uh, First Rainbow Coalition. And it's an amazing film it was on PBS funded by ITVS. And what's uh, amazing about it is it took several years to film, but uh, in the time that he, from the, he, the time he decided to make it to when it actually premiered, um, a lot of the people that, that he had interviewed that were central to the story had passed away. So again, talking about the importance of recording these stories when uh, the people are around. But secondly, um, the George Floyd protests and the Black Lives Matter and the uh, defund police and the end police brutality movements became center stage nationally. So the story that Ray had told of a multi-ethnic grassroots coalition of uh, social justice activists working together for change was really relevant uh, in, in his past couple of years. So we're really excited. He's going to give us kind of the inside story on how he made that film, but also on how he became a producer. So without further ado, let's welcome Ray Santisteban uh, coming in from San Antonio today. Welcome, Ray. Uh, really excited to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, class. Uh, my name is Ray Santisteban. I'm actually, I live in San Antonio, Texas, but I am from San Pedro, California. So you folks probably know where that is. I'm from that area. Um, and I ended up going to um, Harbor College for two years because at that time, not really anyone in my family had been to college. So I didn't even know like how to apply to college or anything when I was in high school, even though I was the president of the honor club, but nobody ever told me like, oh, you need to apply like months ahead of time. So I had no idea, not even my guidance counselor. Like I'm the president of the honor club. I'm the captain of the cross country team. And nobody tells me that I should apply for college. So I graduated from high school. I said, well, I better go to community college. <laughs> I wanted to go back to school. And the good thing was is that I, I went to LA Harbor College. And the good thing was is that actually I was kind of tired of high school because I, high school was kind of boring for me. Um, but when I went to community college, I could pick the classes I wanted. And I started getting really interested in education again because I was enjoying my classes. My last couple of years in high school, I hated them because I was just bored out of my mind. And the teachers were, were not that good. The classes were boring. And so I went to community college for two years and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And um, so I took, um, at the time, I don't know if they still have this, they have um, career guidance, like a test, you know, you take about what you're good at. And I took the test. And so what, what ended up coming out was actually number one was um, community organizer. And then it was like, number two was like priest or like clergy. And then it was like, number three was like, um, what was it? It was a uh, producer and then director. So literally it was like the first time I ever thought about, I was like, oh, that's the coolest thing on here, producer director. So that's what I want to be, <laughs> producer director. So what I did was I started changing my classes to, um, you know, I was taking, I started taking theater, I started taking literature, I started taking art, history, um, things like that. And so I'm in a place, but there's no, there's no equipment. This is before, right when those little small cameras started coming out, the ones that are all over the place. So, but I started like trying to document events and theater stuff. But the good thing about all of that is that I had a really good background in the humanities. So I knew photography, I knew literature, I knew art. And so I, I ended up transferring to NYU as a junior. So I went to community college for two years, transferred to NYU. And if you don't know about NYU, NYU is a very expensive college. That's like one of the like top, I don't know, top 10, 15, most, that's a private college. So the good thing about me transferring as a junior 
is that I saved myself, I don't know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in tuition. And when I left NYU, I'm just jumping ahead, is that nobody knows that I went to community college. It, I just don't have a degree from NYU. So I'm just saying that if you don't have funds to go to college, you, and if you're if you're disciplined enough to keep your eyes on trying to transfer, that's one way to possibly do it. Go to community college, get your 60 uh, credits, transfer those credits. Hopefully you'll get into the, another college. Like if you apply to and, um, USC, UCLA, NYU. I mean, you know, these are the ones that have film programs. And there, might, there might be other ones now. So that's kind of the way I kind of got into the, the field. Um, I was at, a, so I'm going to jump into how I became a producer. So when I was at NYU, you're just taking classes. Like they teach you uh, videography, they teach you, we were actually working in film at the time. And I don't know if they do that anymore, but I was probably the last generation to learn on film, 16 millimeter film. And it was actually kind of a waste of time <laughs> because once I graduated, nobody was shooting a 16 millimeter film after that. It was just, it was literally that transition to video. So everything I learned, all of those classes I took in film are basically were obsolete. Like I, I probably wasted like, um, um, you know, three or four classes I should never have taken because everything I learned was not usable anymore. Um, but what happened was I ended up just by chance going to a, um, a presentation that was being given, not as a, a part of a class, but just um, it was on NYU campus, but it wasn't a class. It was just a presentation. And the good thing about a college like that is they bring in high level people to have discussions. So it was a guy named um, a pretty well-known lawyer called William Kunstler, who was pretty famous from being part of the Chicago 8 conspiracy trial and all this. And there was a member of the Black Panther Party there talking. And so they, they'd had the story about this Black Panther that had been falsely imprisoned and he was in prison. He was going to be in prison for 40 years, but he had, he had already been in prison for 19 years, but he was going to keep being in prison. And they were trying to get him out. And when I heard about that, I'm like, well, I, I didn't understand. So I'm like, oh, yeah, he had been set up by the FBI and the police. I'm like, well, why would the police set up someone and put him in prison for no reason? So I, at first, I, I didn't believe them. So I started looking into the case. And then I started realizing, yeah, this guy, the government could, was actually setting up people, putting them in prison because they didn't believe in what they were trying to do. They were trying to just put them in prison just to get rid of them. And so I started producing a film about this guy named Daruba bin Wahad. And so I, I was learning how to produce and producing is just basically, you know, finding the story, trying to figure out what that is, trying to find who can tell the story and then trying to get funding for it. So that film ended up getting, you know, we gra I graduated from NYU, but luckily, and this is again, you, I, nobody would have ever anticipated this happening. Luckily, that film ended up getting funded by a new organization called ITBS. And ITBS was a new funder of documentary films. So just coming out of college, that film got funded. So I ended up getting a co-producer credit on it. But the good thing is, is the film got nationally broadcast on PBS. And so, and we told the story of this guy that had been falsely imprisoned and, you know, served 19 years. And then after 19 years, a judge reviewed his case and basically was like, wow, why are you in prison? You shouldn't be in prison. And they let him go just out of the blue. Like, hey, hey, sorry, we made a mistake. <laughs> you can go. <laughs> Luckily, this guy, um, he's very smart. He sued the New York State Correctional Facility. He sued the FBI. He sued the uh, New York City police and he got, he got money. <laughs> He won all those cases because they disimprisoned him because they wanted to, essentially. I mean, that's a short of it. So that kind of started my career. I started getting involved in, in, in stories of activism and, and um, of the 60s. That's kind of my specialty. Movements of the 1960s. So that includes, and Victor talked about me working on this series um, on the Chicano movement. That was one of my next jobs. And, you know, so I have this interest in history because, unfortunately, in this country, we, there a lot of these stories have not been told yet. And so even now, I mean, again, we're talking about when I was about your age, I'm much older now. And even now there's still lots of these stories out there waiting. So that's, that's, that's good for you, for you folks, because you know, your generation has a lot of potential stories to tell that have never been told. And so I probably worked on three or four films about, about activism. I worked on a film about the American Indian movement called Incident at Oglala. Um, as an archival researcher. I worked on a film also as an archival researcher um, about the Young Lords in New York. Um, 
And then I worked on that Chicano series, of course. So I had worked on films about Native Americans, the Black Panthers, the Chicano movement. And, and in the course of working on those films, one of the things I started seeing was that, oh, these movements are working together. You know, I'd be talking to someone from the Brown Berets and they'd be talking about working with the Black Panthers. I would talk to someone from a Denver movement called the Crusade for Justice, and they would talk about working with the American Indian movement. And I was thinking, wow, that's an important story. How come nobody's told the story? And so one of the things that, the other thing, the other things you realize is that because we don't have, our communities don't have a lot of PhDs, you know, our graduation rates for PhDs is very low. We don't have historians writing books about these movements either. So that's why as a documentarian, I was actually finding information that should have been in a book. Someone should have written about it, but it's never written about. And so that became this film called The First Rainbow Coalition, which is basically me trying to um, talk about coalitions in general, but talk about this specific story. And so I'm not sure if all of you have seen the film, but it's basically about in 1969, the Black Panther Party in Chicago under the leadership of Fred Hampton created a coalition with the Young Lords, which were, was a Puerto Rican group at the time, and a group called the Young Patriots, which was a Southern white group at the time. There were, there were people from Appalachia that were living in Chicago. And so it was a very unusual kind of um, mix of, uh, of groups. Chicago was a very segregated city at the time. Some people considered it the most segregated city in the United States. And so the creation of this movement of three different uh, ethnicities across the city of Chicago um, created a, a, a threat to the political um, system of Chicago. And also that idea of groups coming together is actually a threat to the entire system in the United States. Because if you look at all the communities, you see this sort of divide and conquer mentality that people use. You know, if you get if you get the black community fighting against the Chicano community, they're not they're not going to become a political force. They're going to fight uh, against each other. And I think that Rainbow Coalition concept, just that idea, um, is a dangerous idea for people that want to maintain the status quo. If they want to keep things the way they are, uh, because historically our communities have not been together sometimes. And so the film talks about the rise of that coalition, why they got together, what they tried to do. And it also, I think, is a challenge for our communities today um, of, of, of the possibility of those kind of coalitions. If we had a coalition like that today, that would still be a groundbreaking coalition. That's how rare these coalitions are. So, but it was, a, it was important for me to tell that story because um, again, there's, um, you know, one of the things that happened was, um, Victor mentioned the length of time that it took to make that film. It took 12 years to make that film. <laughs> so every time I say that, I laugh because it's funny. I mean, no film should take that long to make. But one of the issues was, was that nobody knew about it. They, I couldn't, they, were, they couldn't reference the Rainbow Coalition because nobody, there was no book about it. So I had to like, tell them what the Rainbow Coalition was. I had to know what it was myself. Like, am I making a film about it? Um, I, so I had to do a lot of research, more research than you normally do for a documentary. I had to talk to a lot of people, pre-interview them before I understood what the story was myself. And that was one of the reasons why it took long. But also the country was at a certain place when I started and I would literally get notes back from funders saying, well, this is an interesting historical um, story, but what does that have to do with today? I mean, those are like literally the notes I'm getting. And over time, you, you see a rise in sort of the hate groups in the United States. Um, this is around the time when Donald Trump is running for president and his, a lot of his platform was divisive. It was about, you know, trying to split communities apart um, using divisive language. And so all of a sudden this film that I've been trying to work on for 12 years, funders were like, oh, this is a really important film. This is a timely film. And so that was lucky for me because I was able to get it funded. Um, and, and the film didn't change at all, but the time changed. Um, you started seeing the, the destruction of those Confederate monuments, you know, and, and our film goes into the, you know, this, this group, Young Patriots at the time had Confederate flags as part of their emblems. And so it was a contradiction. Why would the Black Panthers work with a group with Confederate flags? So the film kind of explored that. Like, why would someone who doesn't get along uh, on every aspect have a uh, agree to work together? And so that's kind of how the, the story, how that film got made. I, um, I had a, probably 10 different funding organizations for it and ITVS. So strangely enough, ITVS funded the first film that I worked on. 
Passing It On is what it was called about the Black Panther Daruba bin Wahad. And ITV has funded this film, um, the first Rainbow Coalition. And um, again, it was, um, you know, to me, it was important. I mean, it, it was kind of a culmination of all those other films that I worked on. It was kind of like, for me, a final statement about that era, because I'd already worked on four or five films. I don't even know if there's like, what are the movements I would do now? So I'm kind of, at this point, I'm not looking to do more films about the 60s. I think that was my final statement about that era. But I think there's a lot to be learned there. And um, and also it was great to introduce like groups like the Young Lords, which came out of a gang and became a powerful political movement in our communities. And so it was just a goal of mine to be able to bring those stories out um, to public television. And also so our communities can know and our communities have potentially now a new strategy. Like we have a, a template of, of strategies to use for organizing. And I wanted to remind our communities that, hey, one of our strategies can be alliances. One of our strategies can be coalition politics uh, as a way to move forward with uh, whatever issues we're trying to change in the country. And um, hang on, I'm, taking a, I'm looking at Victor's notes here. And okay, so one of the ones, um, I know that some of you folks are working with nonprofits. Um, I do a lot of um, work with nonprofits as well in terms of that's one of the ways I, I, I make money. Um, and one of the things I've noticed is that this is something I'm just telling you, you probably already know this maybe, is that they're always, the people are always apologizing to me. Hey, I'm sorry, we don't have good photos. We don't have good video. And I always tell them, hey, just shoot something on your iPhone. <laughs> just, if, if you, it's better to have a photo in your iPhone than no photo. It's better to have a little bit of video on your iPhone than no video. So, you know, it's better to have, um, the, the, the downfall of the documentation is, just don't do like, don't record two hours of someone giving a speech because all you need is five minutes of it. So that's my advice. Like, because what happens if you document a lot, then how do you archive it? Like you have massive amounts of stuff and then nobody, everyone's too scared to even look at it. Like, oh my God, I have a hundred hours and nobody wants to look at the material. So that would be advice to you folks working with nonprofits is, you know, just take photos of the iPhone if that's all you have. You know, the best camera is the camera you have you know, not some imaginary camera that you saw on the internet. So um, that's one thing. And then also in terms of longevity in this field, the field has changed a lot. And I think the biggest change in terms of documentaries is that in the old days, when I was coming out of college, whenever you went out and to do a shoot, you would have a sound man, sound person, I should say, you would have a producer, you would have a director, you would have like someone else helping you carry the gear. All that changed now. Most people have one or two people. You're lucky if you have two people. A lot of that film, Rainbow Coalition, I did it. I did about 80% of it on my own, like shooting it. And so one of the things I would say, and I think it's important, um, is to be able to learn some skill. Um, I think one of the useful ones is cinematography, videography. You know, if you know how to do that, you're, you're, you can move forward with the film without getting funding. Or editing. That's one of the things I've noticed is some of the people that are doing really well in the field edit their own films, because those are the line items that are going to cost you money when you're making a documentary. You know, if you're making a documentary, you could pay an editor $70,000, $60,000. If you know how to edit yourself, that you just saved yourself $60,000, because you just, you can edit it yourself. If you know how to shoot, and that's that, for me, I'm working on a new film now, and I've done maybe 10, 15 shoots, and I've done it all myself. So I, I, I have zero expense on that. So that's one of the things I've real, really realized. And the key thing about that is it frees me up to create my vision because when you work with someone else, like sometimes it, unless you know them well or you work together, like you're always like kind of attention about, are they shooting the way I want them to shoot? You know, so it's not to say you shouldn't work with, with uh, um, cinematographers, but again, if you do, you're going to need to raise some kind of money to do that. And one of the things I've noticed, because I, I, I read proposals, I actually just finished reading some proposals yesterday is that today, in the old days, you could you could have a sample and you wouldn't necessarily need a, excuse me, you could have a proposal and you wouldn't necessarily need a video sample. Today, everybody wants to see something. So, you know, you got to create something to show um, and you're competing against people that have been doing a lot of, a lot of work around. Um, but I think if you can develop some kind of skills for shooting or editing and create a, a nice sample, you you're you're going to be in a position where you can compete with people that have that have a lot more experience than you and so um that's one of the one of the suggestions i have um and then hang on i'm looking at some other notes here and um one other p um victor asked about advice um some advice i got i didn't listen to it 
Um, but I'm going to tell you, and you're probably not going to listen to me either, but I'm going to tell you because it's important, is that when you're working with people, you should get some kind of agreement with them, a contract. Now, here's the thing is that most of the times when you're starting out, you're working with your friends. You're like, I don't want to get a contract from my friend. They're my friend. But here's the thing is you might be a very moral person. You might be a very um, upright person. But what a, one of these I've seen a, a lot of times is once money is involved, once prestige is involved, and once if people believe your film is going to be good, people start changing around you. And people, I've seen people take over projects. I've seen people, you know, try to get a bigger credit that they should get. So what your contract should say is, you are going to work on my film, and this is the credit you're going to get. That's basically what the contract should say, and have them sign it. Because I've seen it happen. Um, and here's the other thing is sometimes you want to work with someone that has more, more credits than you because, hey, they're going to help you out, right? But here's the thing. They have more credits. They know the field better than you do. So one of the other things I've seen is you might, it might be your idea, but they'll get, this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, oh, well, you, everybody has a good idea, but I'm the one that can help you make your film done. And they take over your film. So, you know, it's, it's a real tough thing you got to do, but you got to make sure that you get a contract from them and say, I'm the director. You're, if they're a co-director, say whose name is first? Is your name first or is their name first? You know, because I've seen, there's some people out there that are unscrupulous and they're going to, and, and everyone says, oh, ideas are all over the place. Ideas, that's not true. Good ideas are hard to find. And if somebody thinks they can make money off it, they will try to steal your idea. So um, anyway, it's a harsh way to think, but unfortunately in this society, people, there are greedy people out there and you have to watch out for them. And um, it just clears up the thing. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to clear the air. And so you don't have to, you know, put yourself in a position where you're losing a credit that you might have, especially if it's your own, your own project. And so I'm looking over here. Um, yeah, so basically, uh, in terms of getting started, I mean, here's the thing is that the key to the documentary is access. So, for example, if the Rolling Stones were to call, like, you know, any one of you and say, hey, I want you to direct my documentary and you have full access to me, I guarantee you, you can just turn around and you can go to HBO and they're going to fund your documentary. <laughs> so it's all about access. So if you have a story and they, you have full access, you're the person that can tell that story. And so sometimes, and this was true of that Rainbow Coalition film, it took me a long time to get access to some of these people because they don't know who I am. They don't trust me. Like, if you say, hey, I'm making a documentary, they're like, well, yeah, well, who are you? And why should I trust you? So a lot of it is developing relationships with your subjects and, um, and you know, getting to know them and developing trust. And just be, you know, always be upfront and honest with them and, and uh, about what you're trying to do. And... Um, I think that's, you know, so that way you don't have to think, oh, did I tell them this or did I tell them that? I'm just totally honest with the people who say, I want to make a film about you. This is the way it's going to go. And I always tell them, it might take three years to make, it might take five years to make, it might take 10 years to make, <laughs> you know, just because then sometimes they're like, well, how come the film's not done, <laughs> you know? And the reality is, is most films take three, four years to make, you know? Um, you know, sometimes they take longer. Again, that last film I made took 12 years and that's not a typical scenario. Most films take a lot shorter, but you just need to kind of get them mentally prepared so they don't get frustrated with the process. Um, so that's one other piece of advice. And, um, okay, yeah, timing. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have in the notes here. But yeah, so basically what I do is, you know, I'm, there are some people, and if you can do this, then you're going to probably do very well. If you're able to work on three or four films at the same time, developing or shooting that's the best way to do it because some you know you're always waiting for the for funding but if you have a bunch of films in development then you may have, you might have funding for one and not funding for another like me i can't do that i really i only focus on one film at a time and you know so it kind of slows me down but that's the, that's all i can do because my mind can't grasp a lot of different projects um, but if you have that ability, that's something I would encourage you to do, like have different products at different phases um, and always be researching your next project, because ideally you want to go from the next one to the next one to the next one to the next one. So you can, you know, make a living and, um, you know, by doing it nonstop. Um, I do have a lot of non-for-profit non clients. I do not have a website. 
So I've kind of created my own uh, niche. Um, one of the things is, is all of my clients are word of mouth. And I basically only work for clients um, for organizations that I believe in their mission. So I don't like if someone like, you know, I don't want someone, hey, Ray, I'm doing a, a, a thing where I'm going to, I'm selling t-shirts. Can you make my film? I'm like, no, I don't want to make your film by t-shirts. Not that I'm against t-shirts, but I'd rather spend my time working for an organization that's doing something in the community. Maybe they're a cultural arts organization. Maybe they're um, an advocacy group working in the Latino community. Those are the kind of clients I have. So that way, at least I enjoy my work. At least I, I believe in it. And, you know, it's not, I'm not just doing it for money. I'm doing it because I believe in the work of the organization and the role that I can play in trying to get the messages out. And so that's just the way that, that I've done it. I know some people, and it's a different way where you can have a website and then anyone can call you and they could ask you to make a video. And that is a good, you know, that's probably, that might be a good way for you to do it. Cause that's the way most businesses run. Like when you go to Burger King or whatever, you know, they don't ask, you know, you know, the, they don't care like who you are, what you are, what you're trying to do. So it just depends on how you want to run your business. Um, um, that's, that's one thing, but the good thing is over time, I've built up a lot of clients. And so the good thing about having those kind of clients is I'm constantly shooting and I'm constantly editing. So that helps me with my own, my own work. You know, like if I, if I get a new camera, I'm practicing on their, on their films, you know, I'm not practicing on my films because I'm learning the camera on their films. So if there's, if there's mistakes, I make it on theirs. And it's like, anyway, I mean, not intentionally, of course, nobody wants to make it a mistake, but that's one of the things I've noticed, like, oh, what's well, a good thing I did made that mistake on, on their film. And I try not to make it on my own because again, you want your own to, to, to be the best. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and um, Victor, go ahead and if you had any other questions, because I've run out of the ones that you had, you had asked me before. Okay, sounds good. I'll, I'll add, ask a couple of questions before we jump into the Q and A. I, uh, I know that um, our um, you know participants, our students who are working on on films, might have questions you know uh, pertaining to their films. But a couple of things that I wanted to uh, touch on on your presentation. You were talking about the importance of having contracts. Uh, the flip side of that is also the importance of getting release forms. And when you're starting out and you're working with your friends, it's it's you know it's 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 easy not to do that and um, and get your work done and get what you need and do a great film. But as you go out into people that you don't know that well, especially if you're working on like uh, social justice documentaries or documentaries that might be controversial, like we're talking here, environmental, you know, pollution. And, uh, and I know in your film, uh, still like today, one of the, um, or two of the unifying uh, things that were going on that united these three groups were housing inequity and police brutality. So when you're dealing with those, you really wanna get a release form because there's nothing worse. And again, if, you, if it's ever happened to you once, it will never happen to you again because you'll learn the lesson is interviewing somebody and having them be central to your story and then having them change their mind. They don't want to be in your film because somebody talked to them, somebody scared them. And if you have the release form, you lay it out, like, like Ray said, trust and honesty are important. And if it's there in black and white and they signed it, it's a lot harder for them to back out. Uh, they may want to, and you still want to respect their wishes and create a dialogue, but to have someone just pull a 180 like that, when you're so close to your to your uh, finished film, uh, is something you want to avoid at all times. Um, so you talked about uh, uh, like being a one person crew. What's called run and gun now. The other great thing is, I, as I keep saying, is the cost of equipment is so much less than it is now that you can actually own your camera, your editing equipment, your computer, your sound equipment for a fraction of what it would take, and you can cobble it together as you go along. You can start with your iPhone. And then if you get a couple of paid gigs, you can buy a bigger camera and then a few more paid gigs, get a bigger camera. Um, but you can make money as you're talking about with clients uh, with the equipment they have or better yet with their equipment. And, and what you talked about making mistakes on other people's projects, I refer to as uh, you can pay to learn something like going to school or you can get paid to learn. You know, And if you, you're on a project, even if you start on a, on a smaller position, you can learn by watching and talking to the other people and then they may need someone to jump in to help the cameraman. And if you have those skills, you're right there. But, um, you know, uh, that's the other thing. There's a lot of research going on now, especially coming from immigrant communities 
that we're taught not to make mistakes, to be afraid of mistakes. You got to do it right every time. But the reality is, and there's a lot of research backing this up, that the truly successful people are the ones that are not afraid of making mistakes because that's how you learn. You try a thousand things, 999 don't work. You, you create the cure for cancer, the cure for polio. You would never have done that if you didn't fail those other times, if you didn't try something new. And I know with us, because resources are scarce in our, in our communities, um, we're taught not to make mistakes. So we have to really untrain ourselves from that. Um, and if, you know, and, and so when you're saying making mistakes, another way to look at it is you're experimenting and expanding your, your skills. You're trying something new. And in the end, if there's a, an artistic or aesthetic reason behind it, it's going to benefit the project. So it's better to try. But when you're in that moment and the lights are there and the crew is there and the camera is there and you have that choice to go, well, should I try it one more time or just play it safe? Train your brain to always get what you need and then try something new to expand your skills, to expand your technical capabilities. Um, in addition to your long form documentaries, you've also done a few uh, really nice short form documentaries. I'm thinking about the one for uh, Vincent Valdez. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about what it is, why you decided to do it? And uh, so if you haven't heard of Vincent Valdez, he's a very talented, uh, very important artist. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's a kind of of our generation, but uh, I think you met him before he became like super famous and then built a relationship. So when it was time to do the documentary, it wasn't like, oh, I'm the famous artist. I'm not going to do it. It's like, oh, you're my friend. Let's let's do this together. Do you want to talk a little bit about about uh, the Vincent Valdez documentary? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I met Vincent. He had just come out of college. And, you know, Vincent was so good at what he did that, you know, he had one show at the here in San Antonio at the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center. And um, the day it opened, it sold out. Right. And then so almost all of his shows now. <laughs> That was the only window I had to ever buy some of his paintings it was that first show and I didn't buy it. That was like the dumbest thing I didn't I ever did. Because <laughs> his show, he had just came out of school. So the prices were like, you know, low, you know, reasonable. After that, that was it. He just was, <laughs> everybody was snatching up his stuff. Now you can, you know, now it's expensive and all that. But, but, you know, again, you know, it's like, I didn't, I like his work. I like what he does. He's a smart guy. And, um, you know, he covers topics that I'm interested in. So again, it wasn't like, Oh, I'm following him because he's a famous. I mean, I don't even know what that means, like uh, in, in our world, famous, but I just like his work. And so there was an opportunity. Here's the thing is um, I keep track of like whatever grants are available out there. And I always tell people, I'll apply to any grant that I think I'm I'm um that I'm qualified for. Okay. So that's one of the things I've seen I've seen is that I have some friends, they're working on a film, and I go, Hey, are you gonna apply for that grant? They're like, Oh, uh, I don't know. Da, 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 da. I'm like, hey. I, I try to apply to everything I can apply for. <laughs> and, and I'll just give you one example. And it, because it's, it's, it's kind of, a, I think, important. Because I had a project I was developing. This was like when I, when I was just out of college. And there was a deadline for something. And then I was like, uh, you know, I don't think I'm ready to apply. You know, I think I, you know, I was kind of on the fence, you know. And I said, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do it. And like the deadline was like the next day. And I, I literally spent like an hour doing it really fast. So, you know, I sent the thing in and um, applied and uh, I forgot about it, you know, literally like, and then like, like four months later, I got the mail and I'm like, I, there was like a check in there. <laughs> was like, so I got the grant. I'm like, what, what, I'm not that, what is this? I go, is this one of those things where they send you a, a, the, to the wrong place? You know, like, what is a check? Like, I didn't even remember. I didn't even recognize the name of the organization. I had to look it up. Like, what is this? And I go, oh yeah, I applied for that thing four months ago. <laughs> So, and so that's, maybe that's why I think the way I do now, because that one incident really, really, you know, put it in my mind, you know, always apply because you never know. Um, it all depends on who's in the panel. That's the thing. It's like, you think your film is not ready, but some people on the panel might really like that film and that's, and they're going to, they're going to vote for it. So you're not even in control of everything that you think you are because there's people making decisions and it's subjective. Some people might love your films, we might hate it. And even though your film might be the greatest film, the people in that specific panel might not like it, but if you you put a second panel there with different people, they might like it and fund it. So you should just you know try to apply to as many things as you can. Um, and I'm trying to think of something else that Victor said. One other thing about cameras, I think it's important is that, and I'm kind of the same way, but I've, I've broken away from it. Is there's always a better camera out there? <laughs> 
You know, like you might buy a camera and you think you're, you know, oh, I got the best camera out. Five months later, there's going to be a new camera that's better than your camera. <laughs> and you're like, man, I wish I had that camera. But you, you have a good camera in your hand. So, you know, try to keep, get away from that. And I'll just give you an example is that this is maybe four years ago, maybe five years ago now. Um, a friend of mine called me and they were like, Ray, we're working on a new film. We're coming to San Antonio. Do you have a camera that shoots 4K? And so I had bought this little camera that I was just going to use for um, because it did slow motion. That's, that's the only reason why I bought it. It only cost $1,000, right? But the camera shot 4K. And I go, yeah, I got a camera that shoots 4K. He goes, oh, yeah, come, can you do some interviews with us? And I go, yeah, I'll, I'll do some interviews with you. And so I did some interviews and I shot it on 4K. And, um, you know, then like four, four or five years went by. And then, you know, and the film was changing and all this. I did more shooting for them later with the same camera, you know, 4K. And the camera was overheating and all this stuff. And I figured out a way to, to cool it down using a little fan, a little cheap fan I bought from Amazon. And um, the thing is, though, the film got done. The film was in, was in Sundance Film Festival two years ago, and it won two awards. Now, I didn't shoot the whole film, but there were some documentary parts that were shot in my $1,000 little camera that was shot in 4K. And when you look at it, you, nobody's saying, oh, you know, the, that's, you know, it looks fine. I mean, you know, I don't know if it would look better with another camera, maybe, but nobody cares is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and so that just, to me, that's the prime example is that little camera that just that they didn't have any money, you know, and it's just, but it was a good idea. And so I always try to work on, on films and work with people that have good ideas and I, and, and try to let the money kind of deal with itself. Like, you know, hopefully you'll get paid later. Hopefully you'll get credits later. And that's one of the ways that I've always worked because you, you want to enjoy the process. Like I try not to work with people I don't get along with because why would you want to do that? Like even, even for good money, I'd rather not even work than work with someone I don't like. It's just not, you know, I want to enjoy each day of my life <laughs> and, you know, like work on something and I got paid well that I'm like, man, I just like, you just, you just feel miserable whenever you work on something that you're just doing it for money. And I can tell you, luckily in my whole career, I think I've worked four days in the industry like that, where I've taken a job, like, you know, like for money, there's probably been four days. That's it. And so every time I do, I'm like, man, why did I do that? I shouldn't have done that. So even those four days, I, I regret, you know, those four days of my life, I gave up trying to make some money. Um, I was, uh, yeah, that's a really important. And I always say also that I have kind of this saying, like, because you want to get paid and you want to know what your value, your time is worth and what your equipment is worth and what your expertise is worth. But not everything's about money, but you do want to get something in exchange. So whenever someone says, I oh, need you to work for free, you got to get something back for yourself. It helps recharge you. It makes you stronger as a creative person, as a professional person. But um, but you're right. When you work with people that don't have integrity or, you know, they're in it for the wrong reasons, it, it's hard to justify it on your own kind of career path, you know, to, you know, to stay uh, on those kinds of projects because it's your, your time and your vision is valuable. And I know people that graduated from film school, they wanted to be directors. They went to Hollywood and they spent 30 years being editors and they're great editors and they're in the union and they make a lot of money, but they never became directors, which is what the one thing that they wanted to do. And then they're working on films that they wouldn't have made themselves if they were directors, you know? Um, so making those choices, but if you can get paid or get something back for your, your work, uh, it helps you do it more and do, do it better and learn. Now I wanted to say, because I was thinking about uh, your, your uh, Vincent Valdez documentary, The Art of Boxing, which was, I guess in 2009. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that you just did one for American Masters. Oh yeah, it's exactly what I thought you were talking about. Okay. Yeah, so 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 now because if if you don't mind, I have it queued up here. It's eleven minutes. I like to screen it uh, Which during one? The class. Uh, the the American Masters, the beginning is near. Okay, good. Yeah, that's so, yes. <laughs> Tell us how again you talk about writing grants and and doing things just to get it out there. So suddenly, here's this documentary you make. Uh, you know, eleven, twelve years ago, uh, because he's Vincent is your friend and you were impressed by his work. And flash forward how you got to doing it for American Masters, which is a national PBS really um, acclaimed series. Okay, okay. Well, just really quickly, is the first one that that action one is is unique because that that's the only film I've ever made with zero funding. <laughs> like I literally just says, oh, I like Vincent. Let me make a film about him. But we just made it, and we, you know, it took a long time because we just we we were just shooting. We just said, let's make a film about him. The only reason I said I don't like it is because it was a long time ago. 
and I was, you know, the, the audio is not, you know, I was learning, you know, I made mistakes. So now I'm like, oh, I made mistakes. But it actually, that little film with zero money opened up a lot of doors for me. You know, I was putting it on my, on my resume and stuff like that. And I think at the very end of the city of San Antonio, it was already done. They gave me some money to help promote it, to get it out there. So, but I literally made the thing without any money. So I, and it was confidence building, like, oh, I can make a film without money. So it was like, once you know that, that frees you up, you frees your mind. Um, now, in terms of this new film that I made, it came out last December. Um, so there was a solicitation saying, hey, we're, we're looking for proposals for cutting edge artists, young artists that are emerging, that are going to be the next American masters. Okay, that's kind of what the description was. And my first thing in my mind was, oh, Vincent Valdez, because I, I knew him. And so I called him literally within 10 minutes of reading this proposal, said, Vincent, these people, they're, they're looking for projects. Can I make it? Can I propose a project about you? And you go, yeah, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. He goes, I have a show coming up, you know, in two months. I said, oh, perfect. So I wrote it all out, put it in there. And so, you know, we got funds to do that. Um, and it was perfect. I mean, to me, that was the perfect kind of film because it's something you want to do anyway, but you're getting paid to do it now. You know, the first one I made without, I just made it on my own without any funding. And I had fun. It was, everything was great, but I didn't make any money off of it. The second one, I was getting paid up front to do it. And then, you know, again, that goes in your resume, you know, it's, it helps you as a filmmaker. And then it was great to showcase Vincent's work. I mean, that's the thing. It's like, also, I wanted to put out there the kind of ideas that Vincent's exploring. So it's a film about art, but it's a film about, about racial representation. It's a film about, you know, um, being an artist and trying to struggle to get messages out there. Um, and it's also a film that confronts he has a big play, painting he did about the Ku Klux Klan, and it's a film that critiques the Ku Klux Klan. It's a film that shows the Ku Klux Klan in a big garbage dump, you know, outside of a city. And so, you know, in our society, the Klan, everyone's like, oh, the Klan, they're afraid of the Klan. And Vince is like, no, 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 I'm going to show them in a dump. And they're like, they're, they're, you, you, you can't tell who they are. So maybe the Klan is your banker. Maybe the Klan is your, your mechanic. And so it's kind of asked, it, it poses questions about society, there's like a little baby there with an iPhone, like there's a, there's a little baby, like a white supremacist. <laughs> it's like, these are questions that I think we need to ask, like who's that, who's against us, who hates us in this society? And um, anyway, I really, uh, I focused on that painting a lot because I think that was the most up-to-date painting about what's happening in this society, these questions. And so, so it, it allows me as a filmmaker to explore ideas I'm interested in using the artist as a, um, as the vehicle to do that. So it was a great collaboration. We got it out. You know, we were able to tell that story and I got paid to do it. So, I mean, what, what more is what's better than that? Right. That's the whole point of being a producer, to be able to choose the projects that you think need to be made and, and help get them to an audience. So so we'll do this video. It's 11 minutes. You can find it on uh, PBS.org. But I'm really excited because I haven't seen this yet. Oh, yeah, it sounds working. I started drawing extremely young. I remember being about four or five years old and drawing. Um, it was something that I seemed to gravitate towards and, and it was really my, my first way of communicating. Um, it was my way of connecting to others around me. Learning how to paint, learning how to construct an image, learning how to tell a story through images. I've always been very focused as an artist. And I knew early on that it was going to require committing a lifetime to honing in on my skills and my practice. Trying to figure out ways in which I could use this work to generate a conversation. I wanted to use this work and these images uh, to connect to others. It's always been my purpose in art to utilize it to serve others. I could see that he was dealing with collective memory, 
but he was dealing with it in a very confrontational way. I, I like him just ripping the bandage off. You know, he's like really making you as the viewer confront, engage with a truth that we haven't been able to share in many respects. His work is so, I don't know any other word, so extreme, so incisive, that you cannot avoid what he wants you to know. Well, I don't have many expectations from my viewers. The, the only thing that I try to incite is critical thought. And so this is something that I've carried very close to me for a very long time, challenging others to be skeptical of what they think they've already seen has been one of the biggest challenges that I've presented myself in the studio. The first time we met was in 2016. I was going to Texas. No idea what to expect. I'd never met him before face to face. And I opened the door and I saw Vincent. And then I saw the city right behind him because he was working on the city, his painting. From across the room when I saw it, it was just a black and white and gray painting of a bunch of clan figures. But then you walk closer and you engage with them because they're all looking at you like you've interrupted something. I've always intended this work to function as a sort of radar. Its purpose has been to be an antenna, a social antenna. For example, when I created the city, my purpose in 2015 was to confront the elephant in the room in America. It was my way of saying, look around, we are not who we think we are. So you go up close and you realize, well, wait a second, you know, they're, they're not all men. There's some women in there. There's a baby, a baby in a hood staring at you. Someone's looking at her, his or her iPhone. So you think, OK, now we're in the present day. You don't know who's under those robes, but they're looking at you and you're not welcome. It was talking about a moment that felt like where America was going, where it was headed, and who knew? It was, it was, it was entirely accurate. He kind of put his finger on something that was incredibly relevant and incredibly evocative about what was happening in our country. Yeah, because even just the slightest, and it just glares, like okay. the whole thing gets lost. He's, he's the worst one out of the whole group. Well, I first met Vincent Valdez and Adriana Corral in uh, 2015, 2016. And I immediately was so taken by them as people and thinkers, and then going deeper and going to their studio and seeing the way in which they work, both of them, to uncover, uncover what histories get lost. May, okay. Are there any clip lights that hang over? He prompts us to think about what it means to be a citizen. And so I knew from the get-go, once I met him, went to the studio, that I wanted him to be part of the show. And he and Adriana told me about this project that they wanted to do together, and that seemed like a perfect fit. These musicians led a public procession of this sculpture into the museum. And I worked with these musicians to perform very specific tunes. One of them being Las Colandrinas, which is more of a traditional Mexican song that's played at funeral ceremonies. The song's lyrics speak about a dying bird that eventually is released, which becomes metaphor for the human spirit. All of the work really gives us ways to speak about things that we don't often talk about. Through conversations, we were thinking about just how long the American Republic was and how many years that has been, which is 243. 
And so at that point we thought, what if we asked 243 people to contribute a significant date that was either personal or historical or both? The day that Martin Luther King was assassinated or 9-11. It could be something like that that is more known or it could be something that somebody said where a family member had been deported. I wanted the piece to be monumental more than anything. Adriana reduced all of these written texts into ashes. These ashes were then handed back over to me. They were mixed into the patina, which is the final coating on that eagle. And so the eagle in itself becomes almost an, a funerary urn or a tomb, a time capsule in a sense. It really was our memorial to a people's history. Vincent gives voice to artists and communities that have often been ignored or overlooked. It's not that they didn't have a voice. The people represented in Vincent's paintings have a voice. They have always had a voice. It's just that until artists like Vincent came onto the scene, they were invisible in representation of life in America, certainly realistic representation of life in America. He's the Albrecht Durer of, of Chicano artists. The social history behind these is, is very deep. He knows what's behind, he knows all this local history, of course, being from Texas, he knows what went on down there. He's an original thinker. Much of my work is the important relationship between past and present. Filtering the present through the past allows me to examine my own complex relationship to American history. I'm not sure that I can say where my work lies within the context of the art world. That's not something that I really think about while working in the studio. As an artist, you know, when I'm in the studio, the studio presents me with one of the rare opportunities to turn off the outside world. You know, time stops. I'm able to turn off the voices uh, and I just allow myself to become passenger to the work. Creating this work has granted me with one of the truest forms of freedom that I've ever known. I hadn't seen that. It's, it's really nice, Ray. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, so, um, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, I hired a, a, an additional cinematographer um, on the interview with. Um, I was trying to experiment with uh, two cameras, you know, um, you know, wide and a, and a, and a close up, but I ended up not using the the close up. So I just used the wide because the wide looks so so good. And I'm still experimenting with two cameras, but every time I've used it, it's like I rarely use it. It's like I don't know why. It's like um, and then for the editor, you know, the editor, um, you know, it helped me a lot because I, I, my style is kind of a little bit slow. And then this is for the internet. And so they actually, you know, 
picked up the pace a little bit, which I think was helpful. So that's what I mean about that's one of the good things about film is you collaborate with people. You know, you try to, um, you know, um, I've been before when I first started, I was very controlling. Like, oh, I want to do everything. I want to do everything. And then I realized, though, but if you get good people, they actually bring something to the table and they help you move your project forward. But so anyway, that's what, uh, that's something I, I, I want to bring out is for you emerging makers is that, you know, um, don't don't be afraid to collaborate, you know, and, you know, the project of personality. And I know some people that are very, they, you know, they want to do everything and they want to. And I was kind of like that before. Um, but now that I'm older, because I, I the, part of it is, is if you try to do everything, you end up making mistakes because you just don't have the time. And so they, 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 they unburden you <laughs> with uh, some of the work. And especially if you have a budget, it's like if you have a budget, hire somebody, you know, they're, they're helping you, you know. And so and ideally, you can find people who, who you get along with and work with together and you, you keep working with those people. You know, the hard part is finding someone that you can work with well. So sometimes maybe the collaboration is not going to work, but it's like, it's like everything is a risk, you know, and you have to not be afraid of that, you know. Everything about theater, you know, it's the same thing. You're collaborating with other people, you know. There's a lot of art forms you're collaborating with other, even, even art, like, you know, they have people making frames, you know, the artists. That's part of a collaboration, you know. Sometimes the artists have have other people helping them, you know, do detailed work on their paintings. So uh, it's something to be aware of and something to be open to. And um, what I've noticed is that people that try to do everything, they they don't they don't make as many films, and they send they they're really tense all the time <laughs> because you know just be it's already hard enough to make a film, but if you try to do everything, I mean, it's possible, but to me, you're just putting too much on you, too much work on yourself. Yeah, and it's also good um, because, as, as we were talking earlier, um, you know, when, when we were in our 20s, there weren't a lot of opportunities. There weren't a lot of doors open. So the people that did open doors for, for our generation were really instrumental in us having careers today. Um, and back then, you could name it on, like, on one hand, like the four or five producers, that the, uh, Latino producers that were out there that, that could open a door but now that there's more of a people it's important also when you're collaborating to bring in the next generation to provide opportunities for people and you can find people that share your vision that share your your um you know your aesthetic your 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 point of view uh, in your community uh and now because everything's uh, over the net they don't even have to be in your same city you can have an editor in a whole different city or a whole different country um i know because a lot of people in santa Ana, for example have family or ties to mexico if you have friends that are artists in Mexico, you're just sending each other files. We did a project where the uh, we did a, a score for a silent film where one um, uh, composer was in LA and one composer was in Ensenada and they did the whole score over the internet. They would send each other files and they didn't hear it together until they were at the premiere. That was the first time they'd heard it and played it live together when they were building it over months over the internet. So there's a lot of possibilities now. So before we jump into the q and I want to thank you, Ray Santi Esteban, for a great presentation and for sharing your work with us. Is there one piece of advice that you would give to folks starting out now that uh, you think would be really helpful? I think it just, you know, if you want to um, be a filmmaker, I mean, just always be trying to shoot, you know, always be trying to either shooting on your own films or helping other people. And again, if you're not a shooter, you know, try to edit, you know, you try to be um, always working on something, you know, because sometimes you'll get caught up and doing something else. You're like, hey, I haven't made a film in, in a year or I haven't worked on a film. You don't want to get to that point because, again, you have to keep challenging yourself. Um, you have to keep um, learning. And so a lot of the time I spend, you know, I'm looking up. I do a lot of I, I love photography, so I'm always looking for composition. I'm always looking for colors. And so, you know, you know, there's different ways to learn how to do it. You don't have to be actively, but I, I spent a lot of time, you know, looking at photographers, watching other films, you know, um, that's another way to learn, you know, um, the cinematic language is changing in some ways. Um, so it's good to kind of watch as many films as you can. And I, that takes me back to when I was in community college is, I, you know, at the time I was like, a, you know, like I was trying to figure out how to learn. So I'd be like, what are the top hundred films in the history of cinema? So I would just start watching whatever people considered their top hundred films in the history of cinema. And so the good thing about that is, I mean, there's some, you know, that the canon is very Eurocentric historically, but even in that, like I started watching films from Italy, 
films from Japan. You know, you start, you know, luckily, um, there some of those canons are from other countries. And so I think it's important to do that is, you know, the top 50 films, you know, that that's a starting point because again, that list is always changing, but I think it's, it's helpful to watch because American films are a certain, are made a certain way. They have a certain aesthetic. So if you watch a film from India, like the top filmmakers from India, Japan, um, Czechoslovakia, Italy, you know, the, you'll see that each film is, it brings you into a new world. And I think that if you want to be a good filmmaker, you need to know what those other possibilities are because you'll notice like when you go to the, the theater sometimes, you kind of know how the film's going to end a lot of times, and that's not good. <laughs> Because, you know, there's a certain way that we tell stories in, in, in this country. And I think that, you know, we need to question that. You know, we need to question ourselves about how we're telling stories, how the stories look, how the characters act. And so you want to be you want to be um, learned in the, in the art of cinema in general. And that'll help you with your own films. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ray. And I think that uh, you gave some really inspirational and, and, and wonderful advice. Um, and uh, again, you know, we're all about making films with the equipment that you have. So I think the one thing that you said that resonated to me was the best camera you have is the one that you have at that moment. So don't wait to start because you need a better camera. Shoot with what you have. Learn, get the skills, develop a style um, and learn how to edit. And then when you have, uh, you know, when you're in an editor, like say iMovie or Premiere, whether you're shooting, I whether you're editing iPhone footage or 4K footage, from a you know a Canon or a Sony camera, um, it's the same process to edit it. You just learn how to do it on a much smaller file. Um, so, well, thank you very much. So, uh, before we jump into the Q and A, want to thank everybody for participating. We're going to put this segment on YouTube and uh, join us next week. We'll have another presentation in the Millennial Producers Academy. Start making those films. Tell your stories. Become producers. Thank you.